All right, thank you. Um, can everyone hear me all right? Great. A little quiet, the better, cool. All right, so what if I told you there's a cyber risk present today that allows an attacker the ability to send you a phone call and your device is compromised? That's it. Uh, there's uh, no social engineering involved, no clicking on links, no picking up the phone, the simple act of the phone call itself. And this threat vector, which, uh, presents, uh, which is present rather in cellular communications today, provides an attacker the ability to send you a no-click execution or ex exploit payload over the air, under the radar, to net code execution on your device. Today, we're excited to share our research on the Pixel modem stack. It's been a culmination of uh, many months of our team's efforts. Uh, we appreciate each of you being here. Uh, we are the Android Red team. I'm Farzan Karimi, the engineering manager of the team. I'm joined by our senior security researchers, Shuan Shing, uh, Eugene Rodianov, and Shiling Gong. So here's our session agenda. We'll provide a brief overview of who we are and share the results of our impactful 2021 Red Team engagement on the Pixel modem. 2021, yes, uh, that's what I said. It took us that long to get PR approval. <laughs> Before jumping into what we were able to exploit, we'll set a bit of context uh, and cover a high-level architecture review of the Pixel modem. Uh, this will be followed by some of our key findings. We'll then cover uh, two CVEs that if you Google today, you'll see nothing about them on the internet, um, aside from the fact that they're rated critical severity on NIST, uh, and as well as our Android severity guidelines. Uh, but these two CVEs were integral in our exploit chain, and we're gonna provide a demo of how we were able to exploit those. Uh, we'll finally cover how we help uh, Pixel mitigate these issues, uh, and one very important recommendation that you can physically take action on today here in this session uh, probably the most important takeaway from this uh, talk. And I do want to emphasize that before moving on, all vulnerabilities in this presentation have been fixed. Uh, sorry, there's no zero days being dropped. Again, we're the Android Red Team. Our mission is to uh, increase Pixel and Android security. We do that in a number of ways, primarily through offensive research, uh, where we simulate adversarial campaigns. Uh, we also scale through tool development. So one way we would do that is investing in fuzzing. Uh, so we build fuzzers that continue in perpetuity for us. They find bugs and make us and work in the background for our team. Uh, we also invest a lot of time in exploit development. Uh, developing quality exploits is an uh, important part of our process. Uh, it helps articulate difficult uh, security concepts to leadership and helps us find more bugs in the exploit writing exercise. And finally, remediation is very important to us. It's a, a key reason why we're here today. If nobody's fixing our bugs, then we're not driving the right impact. So we have a close relationship with our uh, feature teams and developer teams to uh, make sure we're fixing all these issues. A few clicks behind. And so why modem? Let's get right into it. Well, uh, for starters, it's an emerging area of risk in the mobile connectivity space. And there's, you can see some headlines here over the past few months and years, uh, some incredible research by Project Zero just in March of this year. Uh, why all the attention now? So the answer, or the short answer is, there's many factors, but one of those factors is the barrier to entry has dropped uh, uh, drastically. So a decade ago, buying you the equipment to test the modem uh, from a security standpoint uh, would set you back 10 to 20,000. Uh, nowadays, you can buy yourself a, uh, one of these pieces of equipment or a software-defined radio, an SDR, for only $2,000. So thanks to economies of scale, this becomes more accessible to security researchers. Uh, it's one reason why we're also seeing an influx of bugs coming in the modem at Google uh, uh, through our uh, vulnerability report rewards program. So what if you find one of these critical bugs? What does that actually net an attacker? Uh, so earlier I mentioned over the air uh, remote code execution. Uh, I noticed terminology is new for some. Over the air is uh, just a form of digital communication, uh, usually in the form of a software update that's uh, delivered to you wirelessly, uh, hence over the air. Uh, you, sometimes over Wi-Fi, but more predominantly, it's associated with uh, cellular communications. Um, so uh, in the Pixel modem stack specifically, getting over the air RCE nets you code execution in a privileged context uh, within the modem specifically. Uh, that's because there's no concept of identity isolation or network segmentation or sandboxing, uh, which means you can do other interesting things. And some of those things are denial of service. I know a lot of people like glaze over when you hear DOS, but in the context of modem, it's actually quite impactful. Uh, just imagine a, a football stadium filled with tens of thousands of people and all momentarily even connected to an attacker-controlled cellular network and everyone losing connectivity all at once. 
Uh, but for a nation state profile, you have more interesting things that you can, uh, or exploit vectors at your disposal. Uh, you have the ability to sniff SMS uh, or RCS messages and even spoof those messages. Uh, and that could lead to even more impact when you're thinking about MFA compromise angles. So think of all the OTP codes that are sent over SMS to validate or verify your account. Uh, that's pretty impactful if you can get those codes, right? Hint, hint, we're going to be talking about that in our demo that's coming up in just a minute. So what can be worse than all that? Uh, how about a pivot opportunity to kernel? Uh, with full kernel access, uh, you get root kernel privileges, and all bets are off at that point, and attacker can do anything they want with your uh, phone. So I already inferred a bunch of this, uh, so I just kind of wanted to show it in a documented format. Like this is, These were the objectives for our engagement. Our number one objective was to gain code execution on the baseband via the Pixel 6 uh, modem stack. Working with feature teams to fix these issues and bonus points if we can uh, work with our OEM, modem OEM, to fix all these bugs before launch. Thankfully, all that uh, was, all those objectives were accomplished. And before getting into our findings and exploit work, a little background on the modem is always helpful. Ah, very clever. It's not that kind of modem. But I got no laughs. It's a 56K modem, if anybody remembers that from 98. You could boo me, yeah. Moving on, uh, let's talk about Pixel Modem. Uh, what even is it? It provides you with means to connect to a cellular network, uh, when, which then gives you the ability to make calls, check emails, surf the web. Um, it's a critical component with access to sensitive user data. It's a remotely accessible, high-profile target for nation state, um, and has been a historical source of vulnerabilities uh, because it has many legacy protocols that are present an opportunity for security improvement. And uh, it's also very important to note that we're all pretty familiar with 4G, 5G connectivity today, uh, but standards like 2G still exist. And this is an important theme to remember as we go through uh, this presentation. Quick overview, uh, visual uh, representing a high level attack surface of the uh, modem. What you see in blue are the different layers and components uh, from an attacker's perspective, anything, everything from the communication layer down to the physical layer. What's in red is what we targeted for during our red team engagement. Uh, dark red are specifically areas we exploited. So uh, specifically the pre-authentication attack surface in 2G, as well as lower level decoders uh, such as ASAN. Uh, AKA, if you're seeing that, uh, just stands for authentication and key agreement. It's the common protocol in cellular comms that uh, supports mutual auth between a device and the, the carrier. So before handing it over uh, to Schwann to cover uh, attack methodologies, uh, there's one question I want to get ahead of that many of you may already be asking. You're making a big uh, fuss about 2G, but I'm using a current generation phone like a Pixel 7 or an iPhone 14, and I'm connected to 5G. So I'm safe, right? Like, why does your talk even matter to me? And that's a good question, but the, the reality of today is that there's plenty of opportunities for your phone to be coerced or forced into a 2G connection outside your control. And, and these are just a number of factors. There's a lot of a complex logic that goes into each how these factors are weighted. But you could look at network coverage. You can be in some countries or regions where 2G is the only way of connecting to cellular internet. Uh, there's signal strength, network congestion, Battery conservation, if you're on low battery, 2G uses less battery than 4G. So that's maybe a factor that influences your connection. The individual factors here don't matter too much. Uh, the intent of this message is to just uh, uh, note that a motivated adversary will find the right combination of these ingredients to coerce your phone back to a 2G connection. And that's where our attack lives and thrives. So with that, I'm gonna hand it over to Schwann, who will cover uh, the attack methodologies. Okay. Thank you, Farda. So before we uh, dive into our findings, let's talk about how we conducted our engagement. So for our engage, oh, sorry. Uh, yeah, for our engagement, we decided to choose fuzzy as our primary approach. The reason we choose fuzzy is because we have a really large complex code base and uh, fuzzy has been proving very effective for that purpose. Inside of fuzzy, what we did uh, is uh, focusing on something we call host-based fuzzy. Um, this term host comes from Android build system. It's in comparison device. So host-based fuzzy means that we compile our target component into a test fuzz harness that can run on a Linux x66 host environment. To do that, we have to hack into the build system to add support to x66 architecture. And we also need to mock out all the hardware dependencies so that our fuzzers can run without physical hardware. Our fuzzers can run without physical hardware. 
And it, it, in return, it gives us best performance and also best tooling experiences. Another benefit with Fuzzy is that once we finish the engagement, it left with us a bunch of fuzzers that we can continue running on our um, cloud Fuzzy platform. And uh, we can use that to catch any regressions that are uh, discovered, uh, um, introduced in the feature development. In addition to uh, host-based fuzzing, we also uh, looked into uh, emulation-based fuzzing. That allows us to emulate uh, part of the entire stack from the native firmware to give us uh, more close um, emulation to the system. Lastly, we have planned on device fuzzing. However, it was cut due to time constraint. So uh, in addition to fuzzing, uh, another approach we decided to, to choose is static analysis. We use code QL in this case for two purposes, um, exploring the code base and doing variant analysis. Lastly, we always have our manual code review options. We use that to cover high risky areas identified by the other two, the other two methods, all the areas that are not be able to be covered by these two, uh, two methods. So uh, by the end of the engagement, we end up with 10 host-based fuzzers, each of them targeting a unique modem component. All these fuzzers are running our internal fuzzing platform 24-7 without any hardware requirement. In addition to the fuzzers, we also develop easy-to-use framework so that we can easily convert any modem component into a host-based fuzzer in case we are interested in. And during our engagement, we found that fuzzers not only great for finding bugs. They also serve as a flag for us to identify risky areas so that we can spend our effort into the for manual code reviews. Like one issue we found with fuzzing is many times the fuzzers will be blocked for some very minor issues. For example, null point dereference or single byte OB read. Those are hard to explore, uh, exploit. And fixing them requires modifying production code uh, and takes time. What we did is that while um, the bugs be getting fixed, we jump into the area that causes a crash and start doing manual code reviews so that we can speed up the process and find as many as bugs before our engagement ends. The other challenge we run into with fuzzy is that we need to decide which component we want to fuzz. And uh, with modern code base, we have something around like two gigabytes source and the binaries mixed together. This large code base it's impossible for us to manually go through all of them and decide whether a component is worth fuzzing. So instead, we study the three GPP specs and understand, okay, uh, which component is dealing with untrusted data? Uh, which component is dealing with encoded data? We put those components as a higher priority for fuzzing. For example, ASN decoders are always a target. And there's other puzzles dealing with tech length value of data in the 3GPP specs. Those are all our targets for, uh, for fuzzy. And the static analysis. For static analysis, we use code QL in our case, and for two purposes. First one is to explore the code base. As I mentioned, it's a large code base, two gigabytes of source, impossible for us to navigate through. And there's also lots of build configurations. Each configuration with different macro definitions, some redefine of symbols, it's really hard to find exact construct we want to look into. So could QL helped us on this purpose very well. It helps us find all the entry points, interrupt handler services, and also uh, the interactions between different components. Another way we use code QL is for general purpose bug findings. There are two things we do that. One is the identify certain patterns. For example, the map copy that copies to a fixed size buffer, but uh, the size argument is non-constant. Well, it's not a bug, but there's very uh, likely there might be some issues with that. Another way is to do variant analysis for all the bugs identified by fathers. So by the end of the engagement, uh, we also heard the publication of the firmware research. And inspired by this research, we created our own unicorn-based full system emulation. Um, it can support some uh, hardware layers that allows us to drop in the native firmware binary into it and start emulating part of the functionalities. We even convert that into a fuzzer. And with this tool, we, we were able to do root cause analysis on the real firmwares. By the way, this is how it looks like when we uh, run, uh, run emulation-based fuzzers and what happens if we throw it in a crash case that is covered by the host-based fuzzers. 
you can see that it gives us more information about the memories on the, physical, on, on the real hardware, on the real firmware. Okay, uh, from here, I will hand over to Eugene talking about our fi findings. Uh, can everyone hear me well? All right, great. So uh, before we go to our, our, our findings, um, I'd like to bring your attention to a really great presentation uh, published earlier this year at uh, OffensiveCon by Google Project Zero, uh, how to hack Shannon baseband from a phone. So uh, in this research, uh, Project Zero targets a, a different attack surface than we did. They were attempting to your compromise modem from a phone while we were compromising modem from a malicious base station. So this is an important distinction. However, they also uh, made a statement that they looked at 2G and ASN.1 and they didn't find uh, anything interesting there, like maybe all the bugs are gone. Uh, when our engagement team saw this presentation, we felt very relieved and rewarded uh, by hearing that, which means uh, our uh, bug finding effort, which happened one year before in 2G and ASN.1 might be fruitful. Uh, we're not going to take all the credit for that. There has been all other great research contributing to security in this domain. Uh, but with the next slide, I'd like to introduce some context for that. So in the, in the, in the course of the engagement, which spanned about three to four months, uh, our team managed to identify about 120 vulnerabilities with uh, the vast majority coming from fuzzers. So we have about 80% bugs coming from fuzzers, uh, which Sean mentioned before. And those fuzzers uh, run even today in our continuous fuzzing infrastructure, uh, keep finding bugs. Uh, uh, one interesting fact is uh, shortly after submitting for CFP Black Hat to speak on modem, one of the fuzzers identified a critical vulnerability. And uh, we were thinking about withdrawing because we didn't want to uh, disclose any zero days during this presentation. And, uh, and PR and legal definitely would not approve this presentation. But here we are. Uh, the issue was promptly fixed. And uh, um, uh, by critical severity vulnerabilities, which is about 80%, we refer to out-of-bounds memory writes, which are reachable over the air. Um, not all the criticals are exploitable. We have quite a few uh, off by one out of bounds writes, which are very difficult to get remote code execution with in the remote context. However, we also got a, a few quite powerful vulnerabilities, which we will uh, dive deep in the, in the following slides uh, and show how we get code execution uh, on modem using those vulnerabilities. One of them is CV2017-0. This is a, a critical vulnerability, an out of bounds and heap, a core issue which we exploited. And there is another vulnerability which made uh, exploitation much easier. There is a misconfiguration in MMU which renders heap and stack executable. So simply running shellcode from heap uh, works fine, and we didn't need to do any rob style attacks. And uh, with that, uh, oh, another item to mention here that out of 120 vulnerabilities, about 50 vulnerabilities were identified in ASN.1 decoding, so this uh, decoders. So that was one of the major contributors to, uh, to critical issues here. Uh, if you look at the details of the year CB2017-0, we can see that uh, this is a classical, straightforward, out-of-bounds write in the heap. Uh, the code snippet uh, here shows uh, all the details. I uh, hope you can see my mouse pointer here. We can see that there is one byte buffer allocated, and then this one byte buffer passed to ASN decode information mode function, which simply extracts into this one byte buffer arbitrary number of fully attacker-controlled bytes. So this is linear out-of-bounds write in heap. Um, uh, this uh, vulnerability is triggered during the call setup stage when uh, a victim is about to receive a phone call. The, uh, there is a number of ASN.1 messages which are sent from the base station to, to, to modem, and uh, this vulnerability is triggered at this stage, so a victim doesn't even need to pick up the phone. Um, uh, due, to the, due to the technical control constraints, we have about 255 bytes to overwrite in the heap, which is still a lot. Uh, but even with this, uh, Powerful primitive, we were uh, having some difficulties with leveraging it directly to get code execution uh, in the heap because heap is used very heavily. Uh, there is a very high heap contention and um, uh, we were struggling to find uh, any interesting data which we can all write after this object. And uh, that's why we're using this vulnerability to get another more powerful arbitrary write primitive, which uh, we'll show you on the next slides. Uh, but before that, uh, a quick um, overview of how heap management works, because this is important to understand how we get arbitrary write primitive. Every, every buffer in the heap is prefixed with a 32-byte uh, heater, which contains uh, uh, 
metadata about allocation, such as your, how many bytes was allocated, what is the ID of the task which allocates memory. But more importantly, the very first two bytes, which uh, are highlighted here in red, 0400, they correspond to the allocation driver. So it appears that there is multiple allocation drivers used in heap. One of them, which corresponds to 0404, is a partitioned memory driver, which allocates memory for the objects from an array of fixed size memory blocks. And there are different, um, different arrays uh, which your size grows with the power of two. And there is a dedicated bitmap, which tracks the state of those objects, uh, like whether uh, a slot is free or is already used by some allocation. And it turned out that uh, partition memory driver was not very useful for overflows uh, because, again, we didn't find anything useful to overwrite um, there. However, there is another allocation driver, uh, which is system dynamic memory driver, which relies on double linked lists uh, with unsafe unlinking uh, for heap management. And very conveniently, the heap heater for this allocator contains a double linked list. So, um, we can leverage this unsafe unlinking in a, class in a, in a classical unlink uh, uh, heap uh, uh, technique and uh, get uh, arbitrary write primitive. Uh, as, we can sh as we can see, um, our vulnerability is also conveniently provides us with two objects, two buffers adjacent to each other. Uh, at the address ending with 3A0, we have our one byte buffer, which is vulnerable to the overflow. And right after it, at the offset 3C0, uh, we have a heap heater for the next adjacent object. And as, as we're able to completely override this data, we can modify the allocation um, driver ID, forge the um, double linked list, and then this double linked list will, re will lead to arbitrary write primitive during the free operation. And the free operation is also deterministically happens right after the overflow. So I think in 99% of cases, we were reliably hitting free function on this uh, overwritten heap, um, heap heater, and as a result, we, we get this primitive. And to put things together, uh, here is how we're getting RC and modem. Uh, on the left-hand side of this picture, we have a state of uh, memory before overflow. We have buffer A and buffer B, and we can see that buffer B here has a type PMT, partition memory driver. When we are overflowing it, we're changing it to system dynamic allocator. We're also forging here a pointer pref in a double link list, which points to you uh, malicious sysdin heater. And on the next slide, I will get, I'll, 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 I'll explain you how we actually get the stage zero payload. Because at this point, it's not really straightforward, but on the next slide, I will provide some context. But we can assume that stage zero payload is somewhere in the global data section, which is readable, writable, and executable, thanks to the MMU misconfiguration. And when uh, the vulnerable buffer is freed, we're using those pointers to overwrite a free function. And the free function implementation as modem is essentially, it's just a, a stub which calls a real implementation stored in a global variable. So there is a global variable holding the function pointer to the real free function. And by overwriting this um, uh, global variable, we're essentially hooking free function and we're able to run our code at every free, free operation. We can explore uh, a buffer to be released. And here, how, here is actually how it works. So as I mentioned before, before triggering the vulnerability, we need somehow to send our stage zero shell code. We, find, we found a primitive on how to do that. So we're essentially found a way how to reliably send 80 bytes of data from base station to the victim device. And we know exactly where this 80 bytes will be stored in, in modem memory in globals. Uh, there is no SLR, as Sean mentioned before, so this address is fixed. And then we trigger our CV 2017-0 to your hook-free function with the stage zero shellcode. 80 bytes doesn't provide us uh, with a lot of space to implement arbitrary difficult shellcode. So what, sh uh, what stage zero shellcode is doing, it is um, expecting to receive stage one shellcode, assembles it together, and puts it in the executable memory. And then it rehooks free function with stage one shellcode. Uh, 80 bytes is, uh, uh, is really tight for that, but uh, yeah, it works. And, uh, and after that, uh, we're able to run arbitrarily complexity payload on free operation. We're able to ins inspect uh, heap memory before it's being freed, and heap is used, uh, is used a lot in modem. And we implement a functionality for forwarding SMS messages from the victim device to, um, to the attacker control number. 
uh, which Shilin will demonstrate shortly, demo time. Yeah, so let's get to the demo of the remote code execution into modern firmware. Uh, so here is how the attack looks like. So the first step, the victim connected to a legit serial network uh, in the 3G, 4G, 5G, it doesn't matter. The only requirement is that the victim turns 2G on on his phone. But uh, 2G is default enabled on Pixel 6 and on most of the phones. So now we can set up a malicious 2G base station and waiting for the victim to connect to the fake base station. There are lots of papers and researches on how to get a victim connected to a, a 2G fake base station. So this is not a problem. Uh, once the victim uh, step into the range of the uh, base station and connect to it, then we can start the attack. Once the uh, attack succeeds, we will get a full control over the victim's baseline. So we can do a lot of interesting stuff. For example, we can use the job or intercept into the victim's phone call. Or we can modify the incoming SMS message and even uh, send, send out SMS message on behalf of the victim. Uh, here, for demo purpose, we will capture and transfer all the incoming SMS messages to our phone so that we can and demo, we can fully control the victim's Twitter account. Okay. So here is the device we are using. Uh, you can see on the left is the victim using the Pixel 6. And in the middle is the uh, fake base station. We build this uh, base station using OpenBTS. We will modify the source code and inject our malicious package to do our attack. And on the right is another phone fully controlled by the attack, fully controlled by us. So uh, it's an ordinary phone. Any phone can make a course uh, works for us. Uh, OK, so let's get to the demo. Uh, here, uh, you can see the victim is going to connect to our fake base station. Once the victim connects, we can start our attack. The first step is to send out the initial payload. It's a small piece of code. We will broadcast this piece of code into the victim's uh, modern memory. So you can see now the code is inside the victim's modern memory, but it's not, not running. To get it to run, we will call the victim. Once the victim receives this call, the victim doesn't have to do anything. Our vulnerability will be triggered, and then the first steady payload will be run. So you can see at this time, we have a small code running inside the victim's modem, but it's just a small piece of code. We want to do more complex tasks, so we send more code into the victim's modem. We send them piece by piece, and the first steady pay payload, we assemble them together, and once all the code received, the first steady payload will transfer execution to the new shell code. Then the new shell code will send us the message back, so we can see we received a message from the victim the content is pawned. So this message is sent by our shell code from the victim's uh, baseband firmware so automatically. So that means our shell code is running inside the victim's modem successfully, and we have fully controlled the victim's modem. So everything is under control. OK, so this is the first part of the demo. For the second part, we are going to demo that we will take over the victim's Twitter account. To do that, we will put the victim back to a normal base station. Uh, we think simply stop our fake base station, then the victim will connect back. Then the victim can log into Twitter and use GitHub or use other uh, internet resource. Okay, you can see the victim open his uh, Twitter account, check the new message, and also going to check his handsome cell file. And anyone, know who is the victim. Uh, please raise your hand if you know who is this victim. Ah, OK. Looks like he's very famous and important. OK, thank you. So I assume you have a Twitter account, but you don't uh, remember, remember the password. What, what will you do? You will tell Twitter, oh, I forgot the password. So Twitter will say, OK, you give, give me your phone number. I will send you a message which contains an 
authentication code. You give me this code so that we know uh, this is your account. So that's how the attack works. You can see we enter the victim's phone number and the victim receives this message. So you know we have a shell code running inside the victim's modem. So this code will transfer the message back to us. So we get the same message. Yeah, the same message as the victim's message. So use this message, we can bypass the authentication and get into the victim's Twitter account. Yeah, that's how the attack works. Uh, one thing worth mentioning is that you can see the victim can see this message. But in a real attack, we can definitely hide the message, make it invisible. Uh, this is just for demo purpose. OK. Uh, now you can see we have bypassed the authentication and researched the victim's Twitter account password. Yeah, we are choosing a very strong password. OK. So, you know, we already take over the Twitter account and log into it. I, I think that is the demo for the remote code execution into modern firmware. Okay. Yes, thank you. And I will hand it over to Xuan. Thank you, Xilin. Okay. Yeah, uh, just to clarify one thing. Uh, so in the video, uh, you see lots of operations on victim's device. Uh, but those are just for demo purpose to speed up the, uh, the demo. So in real case, the victim doesn't need to do anything. This is a full zero click attack that uh, we can do this over the air. Um, to get this exploit working, uh, we have some prerequisite. We need the first 2G stack to be enabled on victim's device, which is true for Pixel 6 and many other modern devices. And we also need the victim invest in the nearby range and to deploy the attack. It really depends on what SDR you use. And usually this something ends up with like a five miles range. And once we launch the attack, we get a full modern firmware compromise. We can, we can control everything in the firmware. And in this demo, we show take over Twitter account, but the consequences can be much worse. Um, if you get a malicious attackers, they can steal your maybe Bitcoin tokens. Oh, national, uh, national agencies can do even worse damage, sending a message on behalf of you. During the engagement, we also noticed some bugs uh, on the Android OS side indicating that uh, there's a possible pivoting from baseband to Android OS side to get a full system compromise. However, we ran out of time, so we didn't dig further from that, uh, from that direction. The issues utilized for these exploits, there are three issues. The first one is the root cause that attacker controlled heap OOB write in the GSM code base. And also we have a misconfiguration in the MMU that allows us to make writable and executable uh, memories. Lastly, the lack of standard security mitigations make our uh, life much easier when developing the exploit. And before I did this modem engagement, I was thinking attacking modem over the air is a really complicated task. Requires very expensive, fancy devices. And this setup really surprised me and scared me. As you can see, our setup is extremely simple. The core part of this setup is that white box. That's an SDR device. For us, we use USR PP200, but there's many other alternatives you can use. It's much cheaper, can achieve the same thing. Besides that, it's just a bunch of cables, USB hubs, for legal compliance, we put everything in the Faraday cage. But malicious attackers, they probably don't care legal compliance. And for softwares, there's uh, lots of software-based GSM solutions, BTS, OpenBTS. They are either open source or free to use and uh, very accessible. The total setup costs only less than a couple thousand dollars. It's really accessible nowadays. Like other exploitations, we always run into different challenges, weird challenges. The first thing we run into is when we put all these three things into the small box, they start interfering with each other. And radio is really black magic to me, so I don't know the purple fix. What we did is just fine tune the locations, making sure that they talk to each other without problem. And also we have to deal with multiple complex software systems they all require carefully tweaking the configurations so we can get a reliable reproduce. 
Lastly, because we are developing exploits, we develop this one on the production image. And you know debugging on production image can be really a pain. Luckily, we were able to collect uh, RAM dumps when the modem crashes, and that allows us to uh, inspect the memory status when the crash happens. We also were able to patch some AT commands that gives us some visual confirmation to indicate our uh, explo exploitation is successfully deployed. Lastly, as you mentioned that our stage zero has to fit in 80 bytes. It's actually less than 80 bytes because we also need to put the fake heap structure in the 80 bytes so that we can exploit. So uh, we did a lot of study on thumb to instruction sets trying to fit our stage zero into this small space. Luckily, we succeeded. Okay, uh, from here, I will transfer to Eugene talking about remediations. Remediation of these attacks, uh, so energy security, uh, as part of just uh, finding vulnerabilities, fixing them uh, in pre-production, uh, also invests in uh, reducing attack surface and in making exploitation of classes vulnerabilities more difficult. And one of the mitigations uh, which can uh, uh, significantly make attacks shown in this presentation more difficult, actually not more difficult, but completely um, uh, remediate them, is ability to or diesel out to G. Since Android 12, uh, with certain supported uh, versions of Radio Hell, a 1.6 and higher, uh, there is uh, an option in SIM settings to your uh, toggle off allow 2G setting, uh, which is on by default due to the regulatory reasons. So this toggle essentially disables support 2G at the firmware and hardware level, so our modem simply won't scan for 2G networks. And uh, as the insecurity of 2G standard is, uh, is a known topic, uh, there are many features missing there, including, including lack of mutual authentication. And this is exactly one of the reasons why we decided to uh, look in this attack surface. So uh, this, uh, this action will actually prevent those attacks. So, uh, and you don't need to have a, a Pixel device for that. So it works on all uh, Android devices with the supported uh, operating system and radio health version. So all the Android users uh, in this audience, uh, I suggest uh, taking this action and diesel out to G, especially uh, this is very relevant uh, around DEF CON and Black Hat where there is like, uh, there might be some rogue uh, GSM stations, so. And in addition to that, uh, the state of the compiler-based mitigations in very metal code are unfortunately still behind the user space code and even the kernel. And uh, this is something that is work in progress. Android security is exploring possibility to enable compiler-based mitigations uh, for such as a bound sanitizer, which checks uh, for access, out of bound access in, in the arrays, uh, integer sanitizer, CFI in the bare metal code uh, to make attacks uh, uh, more difficult, even if there are vulnerabilities, it will be much more difficult to exploit them. And this is again, like not for even uh, pre-production testing, this is for the production code. And with that, I'm handing it off to Farzan for concluding thoughts. All right, thanks Eugene. Um, yeah, so some concluding thoughts to wrap up our session today. Uh, we red teamed to secure pixel components, not just the modem. Uh, we did find, as mentioned, 20 criticals uh, during our review of the pixel modem stack. Uh, managed to get every one of them fixed before release, well, except for that one we were talking about earlier, but managed to get that fixed before this, this presentation. Um, fuzzing is a big invest investment that pays off. It's the reason that we found so many bugs during this review. Uh, as Eugene mentioned, 2G is an outdated protocol, so flip that toggle off. Uh, we actually just saw uh, an article that talks about, um, what is it, Paris and Caesars Palace has active 2G base stations being stood up right now. So uh, if you're around Paris or Caesars Palace, please disable that. Um, number of other mitigations. Actually, an article was just published by our connectivity security team yesterday. Um, it's so new, I just saw it this morning, so I can't summarize it perfectly. But there's additional features outside of just the same link 2G that are on it. Uh, click the link or take a picture of it and check it out later. It talks about doing things like uh, supporting a feature for disabling null ciphered connected cell networks too. Most importantly, we're just one piece of the puzzle uh, and Android security helped secure uh, uh, these different components. Big thanks to all the contributors. It wasn't just a red team. Uh, big Last thing I'll leave with uh, before we go to Q&A is that this has been a super exciting engagement for us. Uh, and uh, there's still a lot of work for us to do. 
We teased a, uh, a pivot to the kernel a little bit earlier in the session. Who knows, uh, maybe you'll see a, a presentation around that at a conference uh, near you soon. Thanks so much.